episode 18 of Off and Racing. Sean and I are here with um, not Rachel King, not Stephen King, but the real King, <laughs> Julian King. I think it's those two on a distant third. Hey, boys, good to see you. Thank you for coming, mate. I think there's a true story there. Um, mm. How old were you? What do you recall about um, getting Wally Lewis's autograph? Wally. You know, I was working in Chatswood Chase at the time at a retail store called Timberland. And they're doing this promotion for Nicobate nicotine patches. And Tanya Zayeta from, remember that show Who Dares Wins yep. with Mike Whitney? She was there and Wally and now it's, you know, we used to smoke and now we're kicking the habit. And, and I said, it's, it's Wally Lewis. My mate couldn't give a rats about rugby league. He said, I don't know, it's Wally. And, so, and he was a smoker at the time. I said, yeah, give me a ciggies. So I walk up to Wally. I say, hey, well, good to meet you, mate. Julian King. Oh, get a mate. I said, do you want to um, some, see, you want to go have a quick day? I didn't smoke, but I would have. Done it for all. He said, and he goes, oh, mate, I'd love to, mate, but I can't. I've got to promote these. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. I said, well, you're genuine, genuinely a smoker. And he goes, oh, yes. You know, and then every second word was an F-bomb. But it just sounded genuine coming from his mouth, like this is how he normally talks. And he goes, I started effing smoking out of sheer effing boredom. To drive four effing hours to effing training every day. It was F all on the F and radius. I thought F it, I'll just start F and smoke. And it's bang, bang, bang. And it's nonstop. <laughs> and then I go for Queensland and Origin. We got onto that and the rest of it. And, and afterwards, they were signing those little sort of comp cards that they have. So Wally, you know, side saddle in the Channel 9 jacket. And I said, look, my last name's King. Would you do me the honour, well, of writing to Julian, the real King, Wally Lewis? And he did it. To this day, I've got it in a frame at home. Probably my most prized piece of sporting memorabilia. And I've got to work a bit with Wall just through my radio career since then. Would meet a lovely guy. Always accessible. Uh, just very generous with his time, Wall. Yeah. And if that's your um, most prized autograph, are there yeah. a couple of others that come to mind from your childhood? Got a Radman plaque. That was a 21st birthday present. I've got a lot of stuff over the years. I don't know. It's I'm getting Buddhist. Maybe I don't treasure these things as much <laughs> these days. Uh, plus in my line of work, you get to meet a lot of I always say my heroes, but people that you sort of looked up to day in, day out. And, you know, it seems uncool if I go up to Ian Chappell, Chappelle, can you just sign this for me, mate? So, yeah. yeah. And how does someone who studies a Bachelor of Social Science mm. end up in a career of sports broadcasting? Good question. I don't know. I'm a case study for that. I, I did it, I, you know, I did a sociology major. I didn't know what I wanted to do. The thing about it is that I'd always loved radio, but... I'd never considered it as a genuine career option. For me, it's always, oh, these guys are masters of what they do. I couldn't possibly do that. I didn't get into the industry until my early 30s. And even then, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, Mel, her second cousin was working at 2GB at the time. The rugby league fans, you know, you boys remember a, a footy player called David Penner? Yeah. To be halfback for the Eels and for the Bunnies? Yeah. So yeah. David's my wife's second cousin, and he was working in the sales department at 2GB. And so through David, I got a sit-down meeting with the program director, nothing more than a five, ten-minute chat. He said, let's get you in, teach you how to press the buttons and be a panel operator. So I did that for a month or so, and then next thing I know, I'm doing mid-dawns with Frank Crook, God bless him, the late Frank Crook, and then they threw me on the weekends for the summer continuous call, and I thought, this is like heaven. So I'm here pressing buttons, and there's, there's Blocker, and there's Daryl Broman. And on Saturday it was Andrew Moore and Sunday Mark Braybrook. And I thought, oh, I listen to these guys. I watch these guys and, and working with them. And, and Blocker mentioned my name on here. And, and Andrew Moore would always sign off by thanking everyone on the team, including the panel operator. And I was in heaven. Like, this was, I said, this is where I need to be. And some of those personalities you've just mentioned, you know, yeah. Big Man, et cetera, um, um, Continuous Call team, I think you, you worked on the Gus School show, um, a whole list of shows in that 2 GB bakery. Yeah, so, so what happened was I, from panel operator, went to show producer, so I worked with the Summer Continuous Call team as a producer, and then they brought the great Skull, Kerry O'Keefe, on board. I said, I've got to work with Skull. So Skull had done a show with my SEN colleague, Jimmy Smith, for one year. Second year, Jimmy didn't come back, and they wanted Skull to take more of a, a hands-on role. You know, he's going to anchor the show. They're going to rebrand the name, The Kerry O'Keefe Show. And I said, okay. So I worked with Skull and, and Kerry says to me, look, Jules, would you mind just sort of throwing to the break for us, sort of get us in and out, like they do on it. You know, all the sort of the nondescript, absent kind of FM job. Yeah, Kyle and Jackie, uh, one mix. And then you hear their voice. You don't really know who they are. They literally just, that's what I thought my role was. I said, sure, Skull, whatever you want. 
So I'm sitting there, first show, Skull does his intro and then rings me in, and Jules is with me and I'm, I wasn't expecting to chat and I'm nervous and I'm talking at this rapid fire rate and then from that point on I got a lot more involved in the program almost as a co-host. I had no great ambitions at that point in time to be on air. I thought that would be nice but some people would, you know, climb over dead bodies to to get that position. I wasn't one of those but it just kind of fell that way. So I basically owe my career to Skull giving me the opportunity to do that because at the end of that season they go, oh, no, Jules, I didn't know you did that sort of someone we can consider from there. And from there it just grew all the on-air roles. So I did politics, a lot of lifestyle stuff, a lot of summer fill-in work and then when they rebranded 2UE to Macquarie Sports Radio, they go, okay, you like your sport, night show's all yours. Yeah. So that from there you learn the night show and then from that point's where I work with people like Gus Gould and then they had the cricket right, so I got to call cricket, you know, with Ian Chappell and Darren Lehman and Jeff Lawson and Tubby and Alex Blackwell and Trent Copeland, all these these great names, great names. Brilliant. And I've really enjoyed listening to you on SEN for three plus years. <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> Thanks, Diggers. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> what do um what do, what do you enjoy about working at SEN? You know what I love? It's firstly it's not a real job because you get paid to just gibber about sport. You know, we'd sit around the pub and just, you know, oh, this guy's got to open the batting for, nah, 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 so he's the best halfback. Nah, he's not better than Thursday or whatever. They get paid to do that sort of stuff. And what I've loved about SE and GB were the same, is that there was never any editorial interference. Nobody said, oh, don't talk about this. Till we're, they don't tell you what to do. They don't tell you what to say. And so there's an element of authenticity to it. Just be you. And if people like what you have to offer, they'll ring up, they'll write in, they'll come back, they'll say, hey, good to hear you on air again. And so you've got to kind of trust yourself just to do what you do. And so in that respect, I'm really lucky that nobody interferes with telling you how to present your program. Uh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> again, even thinking about it now, I said, how good is this? I mean, I can rock up to work in shorts and thongs, as you two esteemed gentlemen <laughs> do, and <laughs> flick on the microphone. But the other thing too is, is that it's a real community. And what I love about radio, it's intimate, it's immediate, it's engaging. You know, there's people that I've never met in my entire life that you almost become surrogate friends with just through that medium. And who, who's, a, who's a, a recent, a memorable, or even in the past, a memorable... Um, best interview you've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> best yeah. interview. Yeah, what do you think the best one is you've ever oh, done? Oh, I don't know if it's the best, but Macquarie Sports Radio, so I used to get Greg Chappell on annually. Now, Greg Chappell does a lot of great work through the Chapel Foundation raising funds for youth homelessness. And I was interviewing Gregory Stephen. He talked a bit about his cricket career and the work that he does. And I had a regular listener who rang afterwards and he starts crying. And he says, Jill, th thank you for that interview with Greg Chappell. He was my idol growing up. I had a great Nichols back like he did. I've also been homeless. It's degrading, it's demeaning, and it means the world to me. I'm back on my feet that people like my idol, Greg Chappell, actually think about people that were suffering the plight that I was suffering. And I thought, okay, this is the connection that it makes. You don't know who's out there listening. You don't know what impact you say or what your interviewee may say that can have on a listener. And it's, in this case, it was really profound and it was really moving. I thought, okay, I've sort of, through Greg and through this particular person who I don't know but would ring up every night, I've made a connection, made him feel good about himself, made him feel like he's acknowledged as a, as a person. Brilliant. And as you know, we own and, and race horses, thoroughbred yeah. horses. Um, Professionally, what's your exposure to horse racing been? Oh, Early a lot, memory. a lot of bad tipsters, I can tell you. <laughs> a lot of good ones too, but it's it's throwing a dart, isn't it? Uh, earliest memory. Earliest memory. Oh, I can yeah. tell you. Well, back at school, we used to get into the punt, and we go to. I went to the suburb, the TAB, in our school uniform. We knew which tellers would take our fifty percent bets. Oh, sorry, fifty cent bets, and we go and get a little pencil and mark it off, and and we really got into it. And so if you could get from 50 cents a, a two-buck return, and we're talking early 90s, they'd get you a couple of lollies or whatever. It's beautiful, you know, fantastic. You don't go break backing winners, as they say, or, or place getters, as the case may be. 1992, my first exposure on the track. So my stepdad, late stepdad, John, took me to Royal Randwick Derby Day. 
pulls out a wad of cash and he loved to punt, right? So he had his own business and he'd play backgammon and he took these opponents to the cleaners and what a cash. Let's go to the track. And I'm, All right. I'm a young teen. So I go there. Darby walks up to the bookie. 200 on the nose of Ian across. And as a kid, oh, $200. It loses to naturalism, right? Great rivalry it was. I think RSDI was on Fiander Cross and he was riding a Mick Dippin probably. Naturalism. Like, I can't believe you lost 200 bucks. Don't worry, I took it off some bum in backgammon. That's fine. Yes, here's 50 <laughs> bucks. Uh, go and enjoy yourself. Meet you back here in a couple of hours. And I didn't want to punt. I was got 50 bucks. Like that is a fortune to a young teen in the early 90s. So oh, yeah. go to a bookie. Two bucks to they didn't care that you were young, they could see that you're under age. I'll take your money. So I could grab the pie and the coke and pocketed the change, had a great time. And I thought, okay, naturalism, good horse. Be hand across, good horse. And then at school, 1992 Cox Plate. They call it the greatest Cox Plate field ever assembled. Naturalism, let's allow uh, the Japan Cup winner, Michael Clark, I better loosen up, rough habit. And so a mate of mine reached uh, formal tickets, 40 bucks, right? Because naturalism, great horse, can't lose. Loads up 40 on the nose of naturalism. What happens? Falls. Falls out of the race. We're watching thinking, oh, Reggie, we're not going to see you at the formal. You're going to have to tell your partner, <laughs> sorry, love, I can't take you. Why? Because I blew it on a horse which fell in the WS Cox plate. And my lasting memory, my first memory was, oh, Reggie, you poor bastard. And after that, I just remember Kenny Callender there because superimposed what it said, the mighty super duper. <laughs> 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 Kenny Callender. <laughs> That was very funny, very. But it's you know it's it's a lottery, isn't it? It's punting. It is. Um, yeah. Super obvious. Super imposed. Another you know, very popular horse. Yeah. Um, we we're at um, Epsom Day a few weeks ago. One of our owners, um, Craig, who would be watching this. That's his favourite horse. Um, having listened to you for a number of years, Jules, I think we share the same horse. Mm-hmm. Monroe. Yeah. The best. You know, when Beedman once came into to GB, I think for a racing show Saturday morning, my, my former colleague Mark Levy was hosting. Because come meet Darren, he got to know Mitchell really well too and sat down with Darren and I got him to, I went to the colour print, printed out Lonro. And I think it was a photo of Lonro when Lonro took down Sunline in the Caulfield Stakes. I think it was called the Yolumba back then. And he said, oh, yeah, I remember that. And Breedman said to me, best horse I've ever ridden. You know, he called it the push button horse. I was at George Main Stakes Day 2003 because I just, it's the only horse I've ever fallen in love with. I've admired a lot of horses. So I saw the Diva run the 03 Melbourne Cup. Yep. Got it at $9 too, just quietly. Uh, you know, I love Fields of Omar. <laughs> Grant, you know, Grant, I mean, he was a great horse, but a rival to Londra. Uh, you know, Sunline Northerly, that era, admired them all, but it was the only horse that I loved, like genuinely loved, to the point where, you know, horse racing is built around punting and making money. But for me, it was like backing a sports team. It wasn't about the punt. It was just I actually felt profound disappointment when Lonray lost. And, and the only blot in the copybook was never getting the, the Cox plate, you know, slipping on the turn, finished third, that South African thing. Pace said, I don't know what I was doing there. But George Main Stakes Day, and I saw this thing, and Cassidy was on Grand Army and set after the race and Lonray go, Grand Army, hell of a horse. And we were there last day, Queen Elizabeth Stakes. Yep. Turned the tables, but said, I got windburn from that horse. Doesn't touch the whip, never touched the whip. It came motoring home. Uh, Muncie was Guy Walter, Defy a second, I think Gay's horse came third on. Incredible. Just to see this thing in the flesh run. And a beautiful colour as well. Yeah. Just like Oki, just the gorgeous, really dark brown. Yeah. Will Fortune, he's my favourite. Um, Will yeah. Fortune, you probably remember a horse, Kirill Boy. Yeah. Um, we, we, Ran third to Lonro three times. We've still got him now. He's 28 years old. Mm. And uh, we beat Grand Army before she came out and won the group one. We beat her, uh, beat him in a group two, and then we beat Defire. Or, like, so we were racing in those races with Carell Boy. It's a lead company too. And um, he gave us a gallop. When I say come third, like got beat four lengths third. So he gave us a gallop in less than third. But it was just when I saw the horse, when you saw him, in the flesh, you can't explain how beautiful he was. Yeah. Like we had a horse in the race and I was with my pop and I'm like, hey, this horse. Like, Because you you could see your face through his coat. Gorgeous. Just this black, yeah. beautiful animal. Like it was, um, you can't describe, he was just beautiful, wasn't he? Yeah. But could never win a cox plate. That's the... Um... 
Yeah. Always have the Australia Cup, though. Or was it the Hornsby tab when that Best happened? race oh, I've ever seen. That's and so what good. a field. I think the D was in that field. Wasn't it? And just to be boxed in to come out. And, uh, and, and I always love that Hawksy style of running, you know, just to come from the back and come and charging home. Even yeah. with the long reins. Yeah, incredible. If you were to own a horse, what's the what's the race that you'd love to win? Cox Plate. You know, with respect, look, Melbourne Cup has prestige. I don't feel connected to it much anymore. And I think a lot of Australians are like that. And maybe it's me just getting older, but I don't get a sense of the form because we just don't have stayers here anymore. A lot of overseas, which, which is great. I think it enriches the spring. But for me, that, and I think most people, I'm sure you boys have agreed, that's, you know, it's the premier racing Wait for event. age. Wait yeah. for age. It's the best. 2040, Mooney Valley, special track, tight turn, Correct rise, me, short, well, you, straight. You probably know more than me. So does that go to Caulfield next year for one year, the Cox Plate? Mooney Valley shut down. Shut oh, they're renovating. Uh, that's a good question, actually. I'd... I read it last night. Yeah. yeah. So they're shutting down for Renos, but they're saying if it's a success. No. That'd be a travesty, no. right? No. If it's a success. No. Because it's, as we know, turnover. Yeah. They, they might keep it. Right. But, yeah, it's got to go back to the Valley, right? Like it has that's to. A, it's a spiritual home, yep. right? And what is a sport without traditions, you know? Absolutely. And I know the Everest is sort of new and it's got group on staff. It's building its own tradition, but... Moody Valley is the home of the Cox Plate. And the best uh-huh. horses still win. Like it, they, people say it's on pace by. It's like Romantic Warrior, huge. Yeah. Animo, huge. Like they still can come from behind. Yeah. The horses. I remember being on Viscount when it got squeezed by Sunline and Northerly that year and it was the longest protest. And I jumped on the train, got off at Windy, and I said, go to the local to Still no result. <laughs> and I ended up losing. But anyway, it's a, yeah, it's a great race. Uh. We'll publish this in a few weeks, but tomorrow's Everest Day. Mm. And um, do, do you? Uh, how do you do the form, Jules? I ring up my tipster mates and aggregate who they tip. It, it's really difficult, isn't it? I generally defer to those that are more in the know. Sometimes I'm still one of those that go the omen bit. I remember a former mentor of mine, the late great David Morrow, amazing sports broadcaster, and we'd be doing the footy on Friday nights. I said, Dave, what are you going to do when you finish going home? He goes, oh, I'm just going to finish my spreadsheet with my tips for tomorrow. And he always talked up the ones he won. He never heard about the ones that were that missed. And that's, you know, that's the norm, isn't it, in punting. 100%. They tell you about the great wins. They tell you about the 10 that lost before that. But, yeah, oh, I do a little ring around SEN. I've got some, some really good people on board through SEN track. And so I'll tune in. But, yeah, but that's kind of what I do. I quite like that Miles Fitzner is quite a character. Miles is a character. I mean, this you know, Nick and 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 Gano do the Sydney set, and we got Chris Nelson. So across the board, some really good tipsters. When they all pick different horses in the same race, then you got a problem. But I try and look for a bit of value. I rarely go on the nose because I'm not a big enough punter to get return from dollar fifty favourites. So then you might look at some kind of multi, for example. Yeah, but I'm well as we spoke, I, like five bucks a place. Yeah. There yeah, totally. Go. There they go. <laughs> and I'm not a big punter. I'm a five ten dollar punter these days. You know, gone are the days I throw 100, 200 on the nose because, you know, living in Sydney with a couple of kids, I can't afford to take that <laughs> risk yet anymore. But, you know, unless I think it's an absolute certainty, like Lonro back in the day, where I'd go big on the nose of Lonro and, you know, lost in a few Cox plates, which which saddened me. And, you know, it's funny you talk about Cox plates. So I remember we're doing a summer show with, with the great miracle, Malcolm Johnston, and Kingston Town, you know, three cox plates. And Daryl Roman said, oh, miracle. I mean, Kingston Town, not many jockeys would have won as many cox plates as you, Malcolm. He goes, plenty. He goes, how many did you win? One, because he was always suspended. So he didn't get to ride the king in, in three consecutive cox plates. Yeah, and yeah. holds the record, the most suspended jockey in history. Malcolm, yeah. yeah. He wears that as a badge of honour too, miracle. <laughs> he well, does. Well, Wellington, um, mm. you know, country New South Wales, Wellington. Yeah, 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 yeah He was up there as a guest speaker. yeah. He's hilarious to this day. Yeah, they, they toss up really unique characters racing, really unique characters. And I remember, you know, the great Ian Craig, Sydney race call. I've spoken to him and Greg Miles and, you know, and Ian Craig's so old school. And I was doing an interview with him one time at Macquarie Sports and and unfailingly polite in his in his mannerisms and his language. And you'd ring him on the home phone and he said, and he's, I'll be on the chair and I'll have the, I'll be next to the phone ready to take your call. And this is, this is, this is Ian Craig. It's, it's this beautiful tone that, that race callers have. And he had a real old school kind of tone. You know, he had it and Miles, he had it and Tappy had it and back in the day. And, you know, 
uh, Bill Collins further back, Kingston Town can't yep. win. And, and we got great callers now, you know, Darren Flindell yep. and Matty Hill are just world class. And I've got so much respect for for people who can call races. You know, I called a bit of footy, I called cricket. I mean, that is nothing compared to what these guys do. Phenomenal, yeah. yeah. I know you're a huge cricket fan, yeah. but the summer of cricket coming up, five tests, um, our best rival, India and, and England, um, but five tests against India, Cam Green out for six months now. Yeah, so it's, big yeah, out. What, what's he out for, injury? He's had an yeah, operation. Right. Yeah, yeah, so he's gone for the whole summer, Cam Green. So, so who are the candidates? Do you put in an all rounder, or do you do you move Steve Smith? Well, down Steve the Smith, after putting his hand up to open, has put his hand up, said, "I don't want to open anymore." So he's moved down back to four, and that's it. A McDonald Cummins duo are kind of at the thinking. Let's just pick our best players. They don't put as high value on batting position as others would have. I mean, open is a specialist spot. I was warm to the idea of Smith doing it. I'm probably glad now that he's gone back to four. So what does that mean with the retirement of Warner, with Green out, who might have been an option? Well, Kawaja's won. Mm -hmm. Sam Consta's got a double for yep. New South Wales in the opening Shield game against South Australia. The, the last to do that was RT Ponting, mm -hmm. uh, possible generational talent, Red Bull specialist. 19, it would be a big ask for the kid, but if he keeps churning out the runs, well, he may be too impossible to ignore. Then it really comes down, you look at that Australia A squad, Renshaw not named, so effectively that tells me it's, it's a battle between Bancroft and Harris. Harris got a ton in the first game. Bancroft's run return in the past couple of Shield seasons has been unrivaled. Both of them had a taste of Test cricket. I'd say they're mature enough now to seize the opportunity with both hands should they be given it again. Now, I genuinely have no idea which way they would go, but I would suggest that those two are ahead of Constance at this stage. Right, I'd go for the young fella. You'd go for it. Bloody Sometimes you just got to roll the dice, don't you? I mean, what is oh, he, 19? 19, yeah. And he's, he's not in the New South Wales white ball teams. So he's a... What's his demeanour like? Like super confident type? Zen-like. Zen -like. He meditates before his innings. He's, he, he meditates before his innings. But he's not a white ball cricketer. A lot of these young guys are a diet of, of T20 and, and one-day cricket. So they don't have the techniques for red ball cricket. You know, you've got to withstand spells of bowling, harsh spells of bowling. He's got that technique and spin for that matter. But again, like, you know, 19, you don't want to damage the kid there. And that's the risk. But sometimes you never know. You know, we've picked players out of nowhere before that have thrived. Neil Harvey was 19. I mean, Warney had a modest first class average, albeit a bowler. They knew he was special. He got hit all around the park at his debut against in and won for 200 odd, but they knew he was special. Was Clark young? He would have been Clark. Clark was young. Yeah. Yeah, a very good player. And they've talked about Constance in the same breath as Clark, you know, Will Bukowski, Michael Clark, Philip Hughes, you know, these these young yeah, guys right. that just looked at that cut above the rest of them. Yeah. Well, brilliant, Jules. Thank you so much for joining us uh, off and racing. And um, download it, yes. Yeah, Spotify, YouTube, and um, we just appreciate your time, mate. No, my pleasure, yeah. boys. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thank you.